Welcome. It's Thank so you. nice to have you with us today. Okay, first of all, just introduce yourself to us and yeah, tell us who you are and what do you do. I am Nadia. I am a single mom of two beautiful little girls. <laughs> I have a full-time job, really full-time. I do financial administration for a company that does private school canteens and functions. And I actually recently started writing a book, takes time, <laughs> and I am also continuing my theological studies. Wow, okay, so you're busy with the mom and everything, so yeah. Okay, but you discovered your passion and your calling early in your life. So please tell us a bit, little bit more about that. So I grew up in a God-fearing house. Uh, my father is a pastor. My mother married a pastor. <laughs> and I don't know life without God. I, from early on, I was still in school. I teached or I taught Sunday school. I was youth leader. I was praise and worship leader. I was... I've been spiritually very high. I've always known God moving in my life. So I always knew that it will never stop. I, I have a passion for people and a passion for people knowing God and feeling God the way I have. Okay, so would you say that this calling is part of the reason you have been under constant spiritual attack most of your life? Yes, definitely. <laughs> if you take war, you attack the stronghold. Mm. And I believe that I am a stronghold. I am a stronghold of Christ. And we all have an Achilles heel, and yes, I have been attacked. Okay. So, yeah, part of the attack, okay, like any young woman, and I think most of us, um, you came a few retro points in your life where you wanted to find a husband and settle down and there was a pivotal moment with God when you met a certain man. Would you please elaborate on that? So I'll start at the right of the beginning. Uh, it was on my brother's birthday. He brought a friend and everyone was joyous and cheerful. It's a birthday and he and his friend sat across me and suddenly I heard a voice saying, you are going to marry that man. So at that moment, I was like, say what? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked around, did anybody else heard that? And everyone kept on going, their cheerfulness and I realized that, okay, it's, it's just me, mm. and this is God speaking to me, and I, I asked, say again, <laughs> and again, he said, you are going to marry that man. So, okay, after the birthday celebration, I never met the guy again until three years after. I went for a small holiday to Cape Town to visit my brother, and lo and behold, there comes this guy. His name is Rudy. And it was just magical. Walks on the beach. It's Cape Town. It's late night dinners on the ocean. He was just perfect. Okay, and you did up ending marrying him, um, but it didn't turn out the fairy tale you hoped for. What happened? So in the beginning, it was actually a fairy tale. Everything was as I pictured it, almost that typical house with white picket fence and everything was great. He was great. He was a great husband. And it was only a few weeks after our marriage that I found out I was pregnant. And on the day that she was born, Everything changed. He changed. He gave up his job, which really put us in a financial difficult position. 
And for a while, I could keep it up because I had a good job uh, earning enough to support us, even though he didn't have a job. But as time went by, he, he didn't search. He just laid there on the sofa watching TV. And it bugs you. <laughs> it really bugs you. Uh, but after a while, <laughs> I lost my job. I lost my job. So we were financially in a very difficult position. I was struggling with respect for him because he didn't have a job. And just weeks after I lost my job, I found out I was pregnant with our second child. Now, taking from where I was on a spiritual high, youth leader, praise and worship leader, I knew God, I walked a path with him. I was in this dump where we didn't go to church. He didn't want to go to church. I can't go alone. He restricted all that I didn't have a car. It was my car, but only he could drive it. He took my bank cards. I was so restricted and empty. And then our baby was due the 28th of November. And she didn't come. And she didn't come. And the 4th of December, it was my brother's wedding. She has still not come. <laughs> and I could feel that something is wrong. But having this child was quite a big thing for me because I planned my life ahead and I told the Lord from early on that I would really like to have this and, and this and everything was going according to plan. And the day I lost my job, it felt like everything fell apart. Where am I going to start again? It's he hasn't had a job interview in two years. How will I get a job? And I so much wanted another baby after our first one. The day I lost my job, I felt like even that dream is taken away because if it has taken so long for us to even just be financially okay, how will I how will it be okay to have another baby? Now, this is, it was crucial. I cried to the Lord. I didn't know I was pregnant already. So the whole thing of having the second baby was really, really a, a big thing for me. And even there, the enemy tried to steal. She was supposed to be born on the 28th of November. On the 18th, of December, she was only born. And it was by a cesarean section in a public hospital. And the doctor said that this is a miracle because she's not supposed to be alive. My stomach went smaller the more I got to my due date because she was using her own body mass to stay alive. So just the fact that she was born was a miracle in itself. Wow. She was throughout the whole thing of losing my job and him not having a job and she was my light. So when she was born, three days after, we had to leave our house, obviously, because none of us had a job. And I went to stay with family, three months here, three months there. It was hard having a newborn baby, a two-year-old. You don't have your husband. You don't know where money's coming from for the next diaper you put on. You just don't know. And your family also reaches a point where they're not, they're not supporting you anymore because you need to get up and you don't know how. Okay, oh, well, we are thankful for your baby that was born. <laughs> um, yeah, and then just to go back, earlier you said 
You heard God saying, you are going to marry that man. But how could it have gone so wrong if that is what God said? So, actually, <laughs> he went to Middleburg. He got a, a job, but it, it wasn't permanent. And after all this time of staying with family here, staying family there, I decided that our marriage is on such a low. I need to, I, I really need to do something to save it. And the promise I made to God on my wedding day was a very, very big thing to me. So I honored it with all that I had. And I packed up everything, I got the kids, and we went to Middleburg. Now he stayed in a small room in Middleburg. And that's where I really, really questioned the Lord. Why is this happening if you told me that I'm going to marry that man? But he didn't answer me. After everything has happened, and I'm in Pretoria, I asked the Lord again, and he told me, I never said you should marry him. I said, you're going to marry him. And the moment the Lord said that, it was like, A light went on. <laughs> I realized that the choices we make is so, so important. God is a gentleman. He will never force you to do something. And he also said that you never asked me, should I marry him? You never asked me, is this in my will for you? And it really made sense to me. It was almost a magical moment. <laughs> okay. Okay, to, go, to come back to the present, so you are busy, still in the process of getting a divorce and getting your, back, your life back together. Um, what is the challenges you face along the way and how do you see God's hand in it? We're going back to Middleburg <laughs> in that small room. Our relationship really got to a point where he even started hitting me. Now, if you take the perfect man he was to the stranger hitting a woman with a baby on a hip, it went beyond even my worst nightmare. And I remember standing in the shower, and while the water is dripping off me, I was crying. I was so low. We were living in a small room with two children. The room was as big as this, with the toiletries included. It was at a dam where the moment you go outside, you just see poverty and loneliness, and it really dragged me down even deeper. And I was crying. I said to the Lord that if he doesn't do something now, I am going to do something. And I don't know what yet, but I'm telling you, I'm going to do something. I was making plans in my head, figuring out what am I gonna pack for the kids, when is Rudy leaving so that I can sneak out? If I sneak out, where am I going? Where's the next stop? Is there, will there be a taxi? I don't have money, okay, I'll phone this friend for some money, or I was making plans, I was going out. And all the while, my grandfather, he was visiting my father in Namibia, he had his own struggle with the Lord, and he asked the Lord, so why are you letting this happen to Nadia? She loves you. She has given so much to you already, and now this. Why has it gone on for so long? And the Lord told him, but what are you doing about it? 
So he is a very proud man, and his house is his house. So if he goes away for three months to Namibia, no one stays in his house. It's his house. So after I had that kind of fight with the Lord, my grandfather phoned me and said that I have keys at my aunt's and I want you to go there. Your mother is picking you up. It's all arranged. You are going to stay in my house for three months until I come back to South Africa. And then after that, you are going to your father in Namibia for another three months. This gives Rudy enough time to maybe actually get a job still. And it will give you some breathing time to just take it easy. So the moment he said that, it's like, thank you, Lord. Thank you for opening a door that I didn't know where a door could open. So, you know, Salome talked about the steel being put in oil. That was my oil. That was my cooling off. I went to my grandfather's house for three months and taking a step back out of the situation we were in, I could really see what has happened. I could see what has happened to me. I lost myself completely. This fired up, burning, passionate person for Christ was empty, absolutely empty. And slowly but surely, I started standing up. And when I went to Namibia to my father, that's where the Lord really, really took my hand again and said, so let's get up. Um, my grandfather gave me a thousand rand as spending money for the three months in Namibia. And I really felt in my heart that I should give my tithe. So I took a hundred rand and I put it in an envelope as my tithe. And about four or five days later, someone from South Africa called me and said, so are you ready for an interview in the next day? We, we really would like to give you a job. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, Lord. So I got the job. While I was in Namibia, I started working for this company. It's the same company I am in working now. And the Lord just started opening doors the moment I decided that I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight for my life because that's who I am. And when I got back to South Africa, my husband was gone. <laughs> he sold everything we had. He sold my car. He made debts on my name so much. And women that he went out with during this time started calling me and cursing me. And I really felt like, why am I still fighting for this? Can the Lord just give me a sign, tell me that, am I fighting for this or am I stopping this? Because two cows can't pull the same wagon if they are in different directions. And I had a meeting with a woman from Doxa, who said that she doesn't know me at all, but the Lord told her to give me a ring, and it's the ring I have on here. She said it doesn't mean anything really to her. It's not valuable at all, but the Lord told her, and it may say, sound strange to me, but it, that's what he said to her, to take off my wedding ring and put this ring on my wedding finger. Now that time, 
I was still a bit plumber, <laughs> so it fit on my wedding finger. And um, that, was, that was really the sign I was looking for where to go now. And when she took off my wedding ring, she said that Rudy gave up on our marriage a long time ago and he's not your husband anymore. But I'm stepping in and I am your husband. I will provide for you like no one ever could. And he really has. Uh, since then, I have really found myself again to the point where I'm writing a book <laughs> of conversations with God. And I am started studying again. And just everywhere I could see God's blessings in my life. And I feel great again. I feel myself again. And I feel fired up again. And that's where I am. Okay. Yeah, we can give that. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, just to end off, what advice would you give these girls today? Advice? Be still and know I'm, I am God. I actually wrote down a few things. So if you take the choices I've made in my life, you live by your choices. And life is what you make of it. If you're going to let the enemy get you down, you're going to get down. But you can stand up again. Know who you are. Know who you are in Christ and stand on it. It doesn't matter what life throws at you. No matter if you lose your job or your husband hits you or you lose yourself or whatever happens, God is still there. Do not follow your own path. Include God in your plans. No. Include yourself in God's plan for you. And the last is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil. To give you hope in your final outcome. Thank you, Nadia. It was nice having you with us. Thank you for your time and just for sharing this part of your life. I think we all learned something. Um, yeah, so thanks for that advice too. Thanks.